Welcome to this video version of the BC COVID-19 Modeling Group Report. This is our fourth report being released on June 2nd of 2021. And in it, I will uh, summarize some of our projections for the next month or so and discuss some of the implications. So first, let me remind you uh, who we are. The group consists of academics from University of British Columbia, Simon Fraser University, and the University of Victoria, as well as some associated people um, the whole group overall has expertise in data analysis and modeling and epidemiology and related areas. Uh, we are independent of the BC government and the BC CDC, but do have some ties to the BC CDC. All the analysis covered by the report is based on publicly available data and is up to date as of June 1st. I'll start with our key messages. The broad statement is that the old familiar variants are under control for now, but this new variant, um, B.1.617.2, now called Delta, thankfully, because Delta is less of a mouthful, um, it's, it's looming large above us. So most cases in BC are the B.1.17 and P.1 variants. Um, I'm going to refer to those uh, by those names out of habit occasionally, but I'm trying to switch over to the WHO names, the new WHO names for them, which are much simpler, and that's Alpha and Gamma. Uh, assuming no new variants arrive on the scene, uh, cases are projected to increase briefly through June or the beginning of June and then turn around later in the month as vaccination levels rise. This is just reaffirming our projections from the last report. There's no real change in the dynamics here. So under the same assumption, hospital and ICU occupancy are projected to continue to decline, which is good news. Uh, the bad news is that this assumption of no new variants is questionable. So. Uh, the new variant of concern, if this B11, B1617.2, or Delta, is, um, is on the rise, including in BC. Its growth advantage looks like it's nearly double the advantage that B117, or Alpha, had over the original virus, which is a significant shift. Um, so uh, the big disclaimer in this report is that there is a lot of uncertainty to the current projections. That's because first vaccine effectiveness against Delta, given the somewhat unique dosing schedule we're using in BC is uncertain. And the second reason is that it's not clear if we're seeing community spread yet uh, in BC of this Delta variant or just an increase due to traveler sources. Um, it, it's, it's still unclear. So the take home message going forward is that um, cases and hospitalization targets are the thing to watch as we cross our fingers for reopening. Vaccination will be important, but um, no guarantee of keeping Delta in check if the current growth estimates are, are actually correct. This slide is con contributed by Jens von Bergman and provides a summary of, uh, of data uh, to date. So cases have been declining rapidly since our last report, and the province has reopened back to February, March measures, plus a few extras lifted, like the five non-household member gatherings that are now allowed. Uh, it's too early to see the impact of those changes as infections do take time to develop, but we should see, start seeing the impact by our next report in a couple weeks. So this slide shows Dean Carlin's model projections from our April 30th report with new data inserted in red. As you can see, Dean's modeling projections, which are the green shaded areas here, continue to capture subsequent data, that's the red dots, in, uh, across the province as a whole and in most of the health authorities. Cases continue to decline throughout the province, although this decline seems to have done some strange, maybe stalling or slowing down in the interior and, um, and the northern uh, regions. So in this next slide, uh, Dean, uh, this one shows Dean's new projections based on a return to transmission rates from February, March. The model projects a brief period of increase followed by decline later uh, in the month once vaccination immunity reaches higher levels. So this is pretty much the same prediction as we saw in our last report, but just with updated numbers. Um, so this modeling and the plots do not include the uncertainty associated with vaccine effectiveness or the potentially significant role of B1617.2 subvariant, which is also now called Delta. Um, which first appeared in India and has now found its way all over the world. Um, so this Delta variant does not have high prevalence in BC 
yet, but um, this is expected to happen. We just can't be certain exactly when. So Delta deserves a bit of an intro, uh, so I'll do that in the next couple of slides. So COVID-19 hit India really hard in May, and the Delta variant emerged out of that disaster, possibly the cause of the surge, or maybe just appearing amidst um, the enormous amount of viral replication and the associated mutations that happen in that kind of environment. Nobody knows for sure if it appeared early causing it or if it appeared just late as part of that mutation process. So it's now on the rise um, in the UK and it's shown up in BC and other places around the world. Um, so studies have found that it's about 50% better at spreading within a UK household. The, that's where the study that I'm quoting here was carried out. Um, so twice as, oh, sorry, it was 50% better at spreading compared to the alpha variant, so B117. B117. Um, so there's some evidence that it's a bit better at circumventing vaccination, um, first dose more so than second dose, as the numbers sort of indicate here. Um, although uh, n n studies tend not to you know, test the vaccine with the kind of long interdose interval that we are using in Canada. So it's very unclear what those results mean for our first dose, second dose protocol. The final point here addresses a bigger picture of vaccine escape and where Delta sits in that context. So Delta has a higher than expected number of mutations uh, in it, many of them in the, in the spike uh, where they matter most. If we have a few of these types of bursts of mutations occurring, then we expect vaccine eff efficacy to fall further. Um, variant specific boosters might then become very important. So the plot on the left here shows variant counts over the last few weeks. Although the significance of these growth or decay rates is questionable, they are consistent with a broader analysis that I'll describe on the next slide. Basically what you see here is alpha, gamma, and non-VOC cases dropping, like we've seen for a little while now, while delta is on the rise. And the right plot shows these stacked so you can see the relative prevalence uh, you know, in the shading. So here's the analysis that um, sort of confirms the suspicion that uh, you saw presented on the last slide. So the figures on the right show how cases due to gamma and delta are growing relative to alpha. Um, it takes a little bit of explanation to see what's going on in these uh, plots. So imagine all three variants are growing or decaying exponentially. It, it doesn't matter if they're growing or decaying as long as it's exponential. If you take the ratio of cases of, say, delta to alpha, you get another exponential function. And then if you plot that ratio on a semi-log plot, like these here that you see, um, you can see the growth advantage of delta compared to alpha in the slope of this ratio. Now, if the slope was negative, that would mean that delta grows slower, but these slopes are all positive, and they're around 0 0.06, 0 0.07, 0 0.08. So this measure of growth advantage is called the selection coefficient, and a selection coefficient of uh, 0.07 means that that strain grows 7% per day faster than alpha, which is a pretty big advantage. Um, if you remember, before the relaxation of measures on May 25th in BC, alpha was declining at 4% per day. So with the growth advantages that we're seeing from this data, delta would have been growing at that time at 3% per day had it been um, already you know, in the community spread phase in BC, which it wasn't. It's really now maybe on the verge of doing that. So now with relaxed measures, all the strains are expected to grow faster um, and um, alpha was growing rapidly in late March before the March 30th measures were put in place. So you can imagine how much uh, Delta can do now with, uh, with the reopening and plans to reopen further. So it's definitely something to watch. Um, so the, the sort of message here that we have for you know, general policy is uh, it's clear that we need to be monitoring all forms of variants of concern and um, it, it'd be best if that's, the data is all made public. We, we don't have access to a lot of the data that we'd like to have um, that would help us improve our projections and have a better sense of what's going on with, uh, with the variants of concern.
Here, we're going back to Dean's epidemic model to see what we can say about the growth of Delta. So there's a lot of uncertainty here. Um, so Dean has used the transmission rate inferred from February and March as the transmission rate starting again on um, May 25th. This is likely a low estimate given that there were some measures in place then that uh, have now been lifted. Uh, so with the additional vaccine immunity that we've been accumulating in the meantime, the rapid growth of alpha that we saw in March will be substantially reduced. Um, and we expect alpha to decline again in, in mid-June. But the Delta variant could rise throughout June, depending on the actual growth advantage. So here you can see three scenarios using growth rates estimated from uh, other jurisdictions. To understand which of these tracks we might be following, so you can see some, some cases it drops, seems to stay level, but this is actually in fact increasing or sort of more dramatic uh, growth. Um, it's really essential that we continue screening and doing whole genome sequencing and you know, make these data publicly available so that people like us can continue to analyze and make projections that are more realistic than what we're able to do right now. Here we have updated projections from Alicia Are and Carolyn Carline. Uh, this is their model that you've seen in previous reports. They, they haven't included uh, the Delta variant yet in their model, um, but they are showing that uh, lifting measures now in the absence of Delta will lead to continued decline. Uh, there's some uncertainty with the 30% increase in contact rates, but this is generally consistent with Dean's non-Delta projections. The next few slides are from Bryn Wiley showing the vaccination progress in BC. We have the data broken out by age up to May 22nd and um, just a population-wide percentage for this last week, this black line here. You can see those over 70 are getting very close to closing the circle uh, with a first dose and second doses are just coming out of the gate up here at the top. Notice that we're currently around 60% vaccinated at least once, one dose, but if you remove those under 18 from the count, so that's just under 20% of the population, that fraction goes up to 70% of the 18 plus population vaccinated. Um, so that's already above the condition for step four of the BC reopening plan. That's the September 4th uh, uh, date. Um, so given the uncertainty around the arrival of this B1617.2 or variant Delta, um, to fully reopen, we really have to be further along uh, with vaccination than that that target, um, but that does seem very likely because we're already we're almost ahead of that already. Uh, so we and we have months of second dose still to go. So it's just uh, hard to predict for sure because of the uncertainties I mentioned earlier. Uh, so I interpret the reopening plan as being entirely contingent on the declining case counts and COVID-19 hospitalizations for step two, low case counts and declining COVID-19 hospitalizations for step three, and low case counts and low COVID-19 hospitalizations for step four. The vaccination targets are really, um, those are going to be pretty clearly done. But they're also probably not going to be as relevant as um, what, what impact um, variant Delta has on, um, on the epidemic here. Uh, so if we ignore the prospect of the Delta variant driving a fourth wave, uh, it's a very realizable plan, uh, but the big risk is that this variant is going to cause trouble with case counts and hospitalizations over the summer. So we'll just have to keep an eye on that. And remember, there is lots of uncertainty in that um, in that possibility because we don't know what the growth rate really is. We don't know what its current prevalence is in BC. So that will delay the onset potentially uh, of a wave here. Um, but, you know, there's and the, the vaccination uh, avoidance is also unclear. So that remains to be seen. This next slide is a reminder of our position in BC with respect to herd immunity. So recall that herd immunity is the fraction of the population having immunity from either vaccination or having been sick with COVID. Uh, that is required to ensure that the epidemic subsides. So as uh, more transmissible variants appear, R0 increases and herd immunity gets pushed closer to 100%. If we take all the red and orange on this graph and squish it back um, so that its leading edge lies along a radius of the circle of the, of the circle like this, 
That's the percentage of vaccination of the entire population, which is the unit in which herd immunity is measured. We have to get that line past the herd immunity mark up here or here, or possibly further depending on emergent variants like the Delta variant. So on top of that, only an estimated 86% of BC is willing to get vaccinated at this point. That brings the upper bound of our actual population immunity down to about here. Until we can vaccinate those under 12, we lose yet another 10%. Finally, vaccine efficacy brings that upper limit even further down, likely somewhere in this range here among these uh, intervals of vaccine efficacy for each of the Pfizer, Moderna, and AstraZeneca vaccines that are being used. This slide shows the same vaccination data broken out by age on this main plot. This insert shows where BC is currently in comparison with Israel, the US, and the UK, which provides a, a frame of reference uh, against countries that have already started a significant reopening. As you can see, we've caught right up if you count only first doses, but the, uh, we have a ways to go on second doses. It's possible that the longer wait between doses here in Canada translates into more efficacy for our first doses by the time we get our second, but we don't know that for sure. So here we uh, return to a message from our last report. Despite being a leader in genomics and having thousands of samples already available in principle, essentially none of those samples have been shared publicly. Uh, these are needed to supplement global efforts to identify new variants, to estimate rates of spread, assess efficacy of restrictions, and detect importations. Alberta recently submitted their stash. It's time we did the same in BC. So finally, on this final uh, slide, I'll, I'll close here with a quick recap. Uh, if the Delta variant remains contained, June looks good. With the possibility of a delta wave, uh, the vaccination targets should be more ambitious and we should be watching sequence data for anything unexpected happening, new variants, or even just to get a good grip on what's happening with, um, with the uh, delta variant. So delta poses a serious risk with a potential 5 to 10% uh, per day increase in spread. And although um, BC data is limited so far, it looks like Delta is already knocking on our door. So finally, it's time for BC to step up with sharing of sequence data. So those are the main points of our report, and I just close with a thank you and see you in a couple weeks for the next report.